In the ancient world, all roads led to Rome. Then in the modern world of high-speed transport, all roads should lead to the Roman city of Le Mans. Certainly they do for the manufacturer prepared to undertake, in the full glare of world publicity, the most exacting sports and grand touring car race in the international calendar. In 1961, the Triumph team from Coventry in England made good its promise of the previous year and returned to Le Mans. Apart from its duration of 24 merciless hours, the regulations which govern Le Mans make it a technical proving ground second to none, from which the everyday motorist eventually reaps the benefit. Matters of weight, streamlining and fuel consumption are the practical realities of this race, and the scrutineers will accept nothing on face value. All cars must run on the common fuel supplied, and every gallon used will be meticulously recorded throughout the race. From Porsche of Germany comes an assortment of engine capacities. Lotus of England introduce a Coventry Climax engine of only 750 cc's. Ferrari of Italy goes for the big three litres, but as yet the drivers have other things on hand. The Triumph's works team of three cars is once again managed by Ken Richardson, who drives number 27, the TR, to be shared by Keith Ballisat and Peter Bolton, to the pit. Now months of patient effort in the drawing office, on the factory floor and in the test house have reached fruition. The 1961 racing prototypes are ready. Naturally, old friends and neighbours have come along for the christening. Norman Garrard, Peter Harper, Peter Jopp and their Sunbeam Malpa. Entered by the Ecurie Cast, this two and a half litre Cooper. Twice in the past, their Jaguars have won for Scotland. But beyond question, the strongest bid to cover the greatest distance in the 24 hours comes from CFAC Ferrari. Four works cars, no less than eight private entries. Success depends upon the proper functioning of every single component, and by no means least important are the windscreen wipers on this very high-speed road circuit. The French call their beloved little DBs the tanks. But one of the problems of advanced aerodynamics is how to get in. Even the program sellers join the Rhapsody in blue, and the law is constantly on the alert against any crafty fiddling under the bonnet. In the front row of the pit, the elite. At the back, the tradesmen. And make no mistake about it, they also stand who only serve and wait. And on the subject of balancing,
the vintage should, of course, always be served after vespers. The three Triumphs were improved versions of the experimental cars which had shown such promise the previous year. Designated the TRS, their specification includes twin overhead camshaft four-cylinder engine of 1985 cc's, developing some 150 brake horsepower, disc brakes all round, and a separate chassis carrying reinforced glass fibre bodywork. In practice, they had been timed at 140 miles an hour down the Mulsanne Strait. Meticulous regulations governed the pit work at Le Mans. To every competing car, an official is appointed. Called the Planbeur, his job is that of technical referee. His presence and his seals ensure that no refueling is done except in the pit. There the engine must be switched off and only restarted with the self-starter. Oil or water may only be replenished after the completion of 25 consecutive laps. No single driver may be at the wheel for a total of more than 14 hours and not more than two mechanics may work on the car at any one time. If you break these rules or any of the official seals on the filler caps, you'll be drummed out immediately. A full two hours before the start of the race, the ceremonies begin. Jim Clark in the Border Reavers Aston Martin makes a brilliant start. Behind him, Roy Salvadori, then the Grand Touring Astons, and Sterling Moss with the blue GT Ferrari. At the S's, it's Clark and Salvadori, then Ginther's Works Ferrari moving up, the French Aston, Moss, Jean de Bien's Ferrari. Then the rest of the field with Les Leston in number 26 leading the three TR. The three-litre Healy and the 750 Lotus are slow away, and the pit personnel regroup for their 24-hour vigil. First time round, it's Ginther's experimental 2.4 leading Jean de Bien's three-litre Ferrari. At the S's, Jim Clark is still third. Moss has his lights on, and Henskin on the Cunningham Maserati is ahead of Roy Salvador. Les Leston and Peter Bolton are sticking close together in their triumphs. But at the S's, watch for number 17, the Rodriguez brothers' Ferrari, tearing through the field after a poor start. In the triumph pit, Mike Rothschild anxiously watches for his partner, Marcel Becard.
Leston and Bolton weave through the field in close company, and Becker's TR number 25 is not far behind. The triumphs are running to a plan. With a target average of over 91 miles an hour to make good, they are already gaining handsomely with every lap. At Tat Rouge and the start of the straight, Mike Parks on the third works Ferrari momentarily splits the Triumph trio. Now it's Jean de Bien, Ginther and the Rodriguez boys, three Ferraris in the lead. Triumph drivers, Peter Bolton, Les Leston and Marcel Becard, are all old hands at Le Mans. They well know the critical importance of this opening phase. Lapping steadily at 101 miles an hour, they neither get involved in pointless personal duels, nor waste time being balked by slower machinery. The Rodriguez Ferrari number 17 is a private entry from the North American racing team and now it heads the works cars in this furious battle for the lead. The first routine stop, Walter Henskin with the Cunningham Maserati 3 litre, the principal hope of the United States. Henskin retains the wheel after refueling. Pedro Rodriguez hands over to brother Ricardo and temporarily the Mexicans lose the lead. The pabbed Thompson cunning a Maserati rejoins the fray, now lying ninth. In the triumph pit, Ken Richardson briefs Keith Balisette and in comes Peter Bolton in the leading TR. Now Balisette gets a further briefing, but this time from his co-driver. And this is why it's known as a handover. Immediately, Les Leston comes in, followed by Marcel Becard, and the pit organization moves smoothly and swiftly into action. Dutchman Robin Slotemacher is poised to take over from Leston. Ken Richardson doesn't have to take his coat off to direct operations, and while Leston and Bolton clock off, Slotemacher clocks on. The time card duly punched, Robbie embarks on his two and a half hour shift. And there's no tea break when you're muddled up with this little lot. The first splash of rain greets the relief drivers at Tert Rouge and the sharp right hander is instantly treacherous. Immediate action by the marshal. But for Walter Hanskin and the leading Cunningham Maserati, all is lost when lying fifth. Mind you, for a man reported to have a fractured arm, Hanskin, though blooded, seems remarkably unbowed. But it's a sad blow for Briggs Cunningham, whose Le Mans efforts seem to win little more than admiration. Number 18, Sterling Moss, now leads the Grand Touring cars lying fourth. And this time it's Baghetti's works Ferrari who temporarily breaks up the Triumph trio. Hanskin's Maserati serves as a reminder that motor racing is dangerous and the wet circuit is now a skating rink. The yellow danger warning comes as no surprise. The fast right-hander after the pits has claimed another victim. Bruce Halford injured and the Ecos Cooper written off. But at the pits, business as usual. Team manager Norman Garrett and timekeeper Jackie Reese grimly watch the Hopkirk jock Alpine through its refueling stop. In fact, this car is unfortunately later to be disqualified under the rigid technical regulations. But in comes the other Alpine, driven by the rally partnership of Peter Harper and instantly the drivers exchange limericks. Yeah, 
Now, the first breath of anxiety and the triumph of it. Slaughter marker is overdue. In he comes to report misfiring to Ken Richardson. The spare coil already switched in by slaughter marker is checked, but Richardson decides to use the stop for a driver change anyway. Les Leston is sent back into the race. Now Phil Hill has taken over number 10 and struggles to stay ahead of Rodriguez. But here's a nasty moment for Meres. Rain from the heavy grey skies induces a premature dusk as the Rodriguez Ferrari laps for the first time the Moss and Graham Hill Berlinetta. And after four hours of racing, the saloon lies fifth with 54 laps. The works Ferraris are first, third and fourth. Rodriguez second, one and a quarter minutes behind Phil Hill. Peter Bolton is ready for his second stint as Keith Balasset comes into the pit. The Triumph drivers have taken the terrifying slippery circuit in their stride. But Bolton needs all his Yorkshire toughness and determination, to say nothing of a bit of chewing gum, to face the wet darkness that lies ahead. Throughout the night, the battle for the lead raged on. Wheel to wheel, lap after lap, averaging over 122 miles an hour in the dark, the Rodriguez brothers fought the works cars for every yard. In the big car class, it was a Ferrari benefit. Though Sterling Moss went out at 1 a.m., a fan blade having severed the radiator hose, and Jim Clark and Ron Flockett's Aston had been wheeled away. Even the electronic brain calculating the positions got a headache as the situation in the classes became more confused. But it was clearly to be a bitter battle for the team prize as official retirements came in and the field was whittled down to 37 runners. In the exciting darkness at Le Mans, the crowd cares little for figures anyway. Though that sort of figure, of course, always retains its interest. <laughs> After 12 hours of racing, Le Mans is almost lonely. But at 5 a.m., first light, the crowd begins to stir and realizes that, incredibly, this race is only just past the halfway stage. The Rodriguez boys are in the lead by 16 seconds, and the snarling exhausts sound a triumphant reveille. But this is continental Europe, and it is Sunday. Back in the stands, the spectators count their chickens. That was number 27, there's number 25, and there's 26. So the Triumph team is still intact. And what's more, Peter Bolton and Keith Balasat now lie 16th in general classification. Becker and Rothschild are 17th. 
and Leston and Slotomarker are 19th and gradually closing up. Only four of the eight GT Ferraris are left, but these two, Noble and Bianchi, are fighting each other for sixth place and the Grand Touring lead. The Triumph Pit is a model of efficiency, and as his men maintain their timetable to the second, Ken Richardson rapidly qualifies himself for a job with British Railways. Peter Bolton and Keith Ballisat are brilliantly paired, but probably the hero of the hour is Les Lester. A leg muscle torn at the start is causing him excruciating pain with every move. But as Ballisette calmly takes over number 27 at 7 a.m., there's drama down the road. The Rodriguez car has lost almost 20 minutes at its pit. The electrical trouble, which had temporarily slowed Slotomarker the night before, has dropped the Mexicans from first to fourth place, five laps behind the leaders. Now down in the S is further drama. The Beckard Rothschild triumph suddenly spurts oil smoke, but the engine sounds clean enough. At once, Mike Rothschild is called into the pits, where his arrival is anxiously awaited. Quickly, the trouble is diagnosed. The oil seal on the crankshaft chain case has failed, and oil is seeping onto the hot exhaust pipe. So what, says Mike? So you can get in and drive it, and we'll keep our fingers crossed. Meantime, the two and a half litre Cunningham Maserati, with Briggs himself and Kimberley at the wheel, is plying steadily on. The blue and white American cars are popular at the circuit, and the fact that an American driver, Phil Hill, now shares the leading car is in no small measure due to the sporting determination of Briggs Cunningham, who pioneered this European trail for his countrymen. The little French cars battle as usual for their handicap, but once again, the excitement of the race is focused on the leaders. Phil Hill and John Devere are still under heavy pressure, for the Rodriguez brothers in Ferrari 17 are carving away their lead. Number seven, the Cunningham three-litre Maserati, is now fifth, for the Ginther and Von Tripp's works Ferrari has run out of fuel. Meantime, to his immeasurable relief, Mike Rothschild completes his tour of duty. The Triumph, though smoking heavily, has not yet developed a cough and the mechanics almost welcomed the crisis as a challenge to their skill at first aid. Statisticians round the circuit now noted that the total number of runners was down to 29, and Peter Bolton ruefully reflected that it was opening time back home. As Keith Ballisad brought in number 27, it was up to 14th place. There was little to report, but extremely exciting possibilities were rapidly becoming apparent. At this time, fatigue becomes a very real factor at Le Mans, but you'll be hard put to it to spot any sign of tiredness here after 20 hours of racing. Mike Rothschild again takes out the smoking number 25. Mike Parks and Meres with Ferrari number 11 know that the incredible Rodriguez are now hard after them for second place. Aware of the ferocious Ferrari battle, the Triumph team gives a demonstration of the courtesy which exists between top flight racing drivers. Rodriguez, about to take Mike Parks, is now only three laps behind the leader and gaining fast, while others lose slowly. The surviving Sunbeam is on its way to the Thermal Efficiency Award, though well behind the Triumphs. But the Porsches, which had been the TR's most serious challenge for the team prize, now run into trouble. 
the 1700 of Joachim Bonnier and Dan Ganey has its flywheel come adrift. The bearded Bonnier has his coat on in readiness to go home. But first, there must be a thorough investigation on the spot. Achtung, alles is nicht in ordnung. Eventually, the Porsche of Lange and Bonn goes out again, though now behind the triumph of Bolton and Balliset. Once again, the Pabst Thompson 3-litre Cunningham Maserati is in for fuel. The rear-engine V12 Type 63 has twice changed all its 24 spark plugs, and the drivers too seem to be having some rear-end trouble. Maybe the seat could do with a little more padding, but at least the timekeeper has a proper windscreen. Anyway, the car is still running strongly and is destined to finish a very gallant fourth. However, it's Rothschild's turn once again to assume responsibility for number 25. Becker reports to Richardson that despite the oil leak, the car continues to run extremely well. And as the fuel tank is resealed, the triumphs continue as an unbroken team of three cars, although the situation is not without anxiety. Suddenly, with only two hours to go, in comes Pedro Rodriguez. But there's no fire to extinguish except the flame of a gallant and forlorn hope. After 22 hours of desperate struggle against overwhelming odds, the Ferrari entered by the North American racing team succumbs to the pace which its own drivers have set. But the little Mexicans, Pedro and Ricardo Rodriguez, have won the hearts of a quarter of a million spectators and the admiration of every motorsport enthusiast in the world. Sterling Moss knows how it feels to be beaten by misfortune, and Pedro realizes that he was making up enough time for it to have been just possible to win. But they're sportsmen as well as fighters, these brave little Mexicans, the Rodriguez brothers. Now Mike Parks comes in, secure in second place at his first Le Mans. As the Belgian Billy Mares takes over the last spell from the Englishman, they are four laps behind their teammates in the lead, but a clear nine laps ahead of their nearest pursuer. Even now, there is still time for defeat. The Healy 3000 of Beckett and Stoop comes to rest as the vanquished Rodriguez car is saluted by the crowd. The last of the Aston Martins. The French entered DB4 of Kerguin was lying ninth when it finally joined John Ogier's Zagato saloons and the open DBR1s of Clark and Salvadori on the retired list. But still, the number 25 triumph smouldered on, and the moment of truth was at hand. While the mechanics did what they could, the time had come for strategy. Team manager and chief engineer confer, and Ken Richardson shoulders a heavy responsibility. At the Ferrari pit too, this is an anxious time. Olivier Jean de Bien may look debonair, but the waiting does not pass easily. Now in comes the leader for what should be his last pit stop of the race. Twice before, both Hill and Jean de Bien have won. Their responsibility now is almost overwhelming. And it's Phil Hill who carries on.
At the Triumph Pit, number 25 is still stationary, and every British spectator holds his breath. Les Leston comes in with number 26, and Robin Slatermarker gets a final meticulous briefing from Ken Richardson. Tunner, the reserve Triumph driver, metaphorically holds Mike Rothschild's hand as Slaughtermarker goes out in 13th place. Now Peter Bolton brings in the leading TR and gets a hand from his co-driver Keith Ballisett. Ever mindful of the stringent regulations, even at this late hour, Ballisat eases the TR back to clear the Park Triumph's tail, and then rejoins the race in the leading British car. But now there's a buzz of interest round the pits. Number 25 is once again refueled. So much time have the Triumphs gained against their minimum qualifying average speed that Ken Richardson has deliberately held the car at the pits to be sure of its finishing. And this, the knowledgeable crowd appreciates. The closing hour. In the back of their pit, the Triumph mechanics relax. They've done their job, none better. And now is the time to check up on what the rest of the world's been up to. Mike Rothschild passes the stands and all is well. The vast crowd counts the seconds to four o'clock. And there it is, 24 hours of concentrated motor racing history have passed. In the order that they finished, the three triumphs crossed the line, the only complete team of three cars to do so. Phil Hill brings home the winning Ferrari with a record 2,782 miles in the 24 hours. Mike Parks and Meres are second, some 24 miles behind. But the poor little special delivery drivers are going to have a hard time getting through that lot. Keith Ballisat is joined by the now immaculate Bolton. They finish ninth in the highest placed British car at 98.9 miles an hour for the 24. The gallant Les Leston, now suffering intense pain, is supported literally by his partner Slaughtermarker. They finish 11th at 97.1, and Mike Rothschild and Marcel Becker are 15th in number 25, slowed but still easily qualified at 91.2, despite the broken oil seal. It's thumbs up all the way, and the international team of Triumph drivers, British, American, Dutch and French, have added a great achievement to their individual brilliant careers. The three triumphs which came to Le Mans did exactly what was expected of them by achieving a target of speed and reliability unequaled in the race. This indeed was triumph at Le Mans.